Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sally Benson. I've been the, the uh, director of the Global Climate and Energy Project for a long time. Um, for those of you who've been here coming year after year, um, you've seen me and, uh, and I've, uh, I've seen you. So uh, anyway, so, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are really excited. This is the 13th annual uh, Global Climate and Energy Project Symposium, and I think you're in for a real treat because, like always, we have an amazing group of speakers here. And this year, um, the focus, the theme for our event will be, um, you know, advancing uh, energy research, GSEP and beyond. We're going to be looking out to the next, uh, the next 15 years. So I thought it would be wonderful to take this moment to talk a little bit about the history and evolution of the GSEP portfolio of research. And I'd like to begin by sort of giving you the snap snapshot of what we did in the end. So this is a, a pie chart that illustrates all the areas of research we have worked in, and you can see um, it's very broad, very diverse, and this was by design. Uh, and, and this was a portfolio that was really developed organically uh, seeking the best ideas from Stanford faculty and seeking the best ideas from faculty um, and, and students and, and, and so forth from around the world. So you can divide this up into a number of big categories. The, the single largest group of investment was in the area of renewable energy research. And uh, the next largest was in the area of carbon-based energy systems, basically trying to find ways to use fossil fuels more efficiently and to, to decarbonize them. Uh, in the later years, we started to do a lot of work in, in energy storage and, and, uh, and fuel cells. Uh, we then also, in the early days, did a lot of work on hydrogen. And, and all throughout this time period, we use sort of systems analysis, energy systems analysis, to underpin a lot of the strategic thinking and decision making about GSEP. So, so the way this, this, these proposals were selected was we had a, a list of categories uh, that, that faculty could propose to, um, uh, to do work with us. And in addition to that, we would look at our portfolio and we'd always ask the question, what's missing? And we identified a number of areas what, that were missing, and those were the areas we actually would um, solicit ideas from uh, faculty from universities around the world. And I thought I could just highlight some of these. So, uh, so the first one of these, we called these targeted calls for proposals was in the area of hydrogen. And what we would do before we would issue a call for proposals, we would invite the leading experts from around the world to come spend a day or two with us identifying what were the opportunities, what were the challenges, what were the critical areas where, where uh, deep and thoughtful research could make a difference. So hydrogen was the first one. Uh, the next one was on advanced coal utilization. Uh, and we had a number of ideas in, in that area. Uh, we next, in 2006, moved on to fuel cells and batteries and got our first proposals for uh, new uh, battery architectures and advanced fuel cells. Next was high efficiency PV. Uh, this was the really pushing the efficiency frontier, uh, solar cells that could perform with efficiencies of better than 44%. So radically new ideas that would open up the third generation of photovoltaic cells. Uh, after that, uh, we shine, um, looked at uh, biofuels and in particular identified a very uh, challenging problem of lignin management. L lignin is very recalcitrant and if we could find a better way to convert lignin to sugars or to, to uh, l allow the lignin not to interfere with the conversion to sugars that, um, that biofuels could be unlocked in terms of greater potential. Uh, we then moved on to the electric grid. Um, uh, we hypothesized that one uh, when uh, solar cells and wind became inexpensive enough that the next big challenge, the grand challenge, would be grid integration. And as you see, many of these ideas, I, th I think what you'll see is that long before these became terribly popular topics, uh, GSEP had identified these as important areas of pursuit. Uh, we then moved on to grid-scale grid storage, which was uh, obviously going to be key as we had inexpensive uh, renewable electricity and we had a better grid. Uh, we need that could then move on to thinking about how are we going to store all that energy. 
Um, but carbon capture and, and storage, uh, very critical technology for deep decarbonization. Uh, we didn't do any work in carbon capture, so we, we went out to the, to the community and, and got a lot of good ideas there. And then in 2012, I think very interesting, negative emissions. Um, this is the idea that you can um, actually extract carbon dioxide from the, air, from the atmosphere and sequester it either in useful products or you can um, pump it underground or trap it in, in, in um, biomat biological matter, trees, trees, soils, and, and, and so forth. And this was 2012, again, long before negative emissions had become sort of a part of the everyday discussion about how we were going to deal with climate change. Moving on to developing countries, you know, in spite of the fact that by 2013 the price of renewables had dropped dramatically, they still weren't nearly inexpensive enough to deploy at a grand scale in the developing countries. So could we find much more inexpensive ways to produce these critical technologies? So that's how this is developed. Um, so uh, anyway, I thought that would be fun history for you to see all that and this, this organic and slightly targeted evolution of this portfolio. So, uh, so just yesterday we had our management committee meeting and we always sort of take stock of what's happened in GSEP and, uh, and, and there were some numbers that kind of blew me away. So uh, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of GSEP by the numbers. Uh, so 100 um, full-scale proposals funded. These were projects that were multiple year, typically three years. Uh, they were funded at a high enough level that typically multiple faculty members could collaborate with a team of students, uh, which I think was really unique and, and, and one of the main reasons GSEP was so impactful. Um, 935 peer-reviewed publications in leading journals and counting. Uh, that's an enormous, uh, enormous contribution from all of the faculty and students, uh, staff who participate in this program. And then one that I think you should all be incredibly proud of is that the field-weighted impact factor of of the GSIP portfolio of publications actually has a, a five times higher impact factor than the, than the field average. Okay, but that's good. You expect that, right? You know, from the amazing group of people. But it's two and a half times as good as the average Stanford publication. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm very proud of that. So uh, anyway, you all did a really great job. And it also attests to the, uh, the, the interest in, in these new energy technologies. So now I thought I'd just sort of do a little very quick walk through the, uh, the particular areas where, uh, where GSEP uh, focused its attention. And the first one I'd like to talk about is CO2 capture and storage. So, so picture, you know, you're now back uh, in, in the early days. Um, at this point, there were two uh, CO2 storage projects in the world. There was one in, uh, in Norway, uh, and then there was one in Canada. Uh, but really, very, the fundamental science of CO2 storage was largely unknown, and, and how we would manage underground injection to optimize these processes uh, needed a tremendous amount of work, and, and, and GSEP has worked on this area continually. So uh, some of the early work we did is uh, some work by Lenore, actually, on CO2 enhanced oil recovery. And he and his team figured out that if we manage the reservoir differently than, than you do for a typical enhanced oil recovery operation, that you could actually store much more CO2 uh, per ton of, or per barrel of oil that, that you produce. Uh, next was this idea that when you put uh, carbon dioxide in, in an underground aquifer, that it begins to dissolve in the water, and it creates very complex uh, convective mixing. And this was a problem that was really computationally intractable, and, and uh, Hamdi Chalepi and Lynn and, and colleagues really wrote the first and most important publication on this, which is still the number one publication in this area. Uh, they then moved on to, to, to understand more about something uh, called residual gas trapping and did really the first simulations to show that this could actually contribute very, very substantially to, uh, to increasing the security of carbon dioxide storage by immobilizing the CO2 so it couldn't escape from the reservoir. And moving on from that, the question became, well, 
what is it exactly that leads to um, residual trapping of CO2 and immobilization of CO2? And we began to do experiments that sh showed that the heterogeneity of rocks is really a key factor that controls how much of this trapping. But then we wanted to be able to predict quantitatively how this worked, and so we we developed methods for mapping the subcore scale properties of a rock, never been, never been done before, and showed that you could quantitatively uh, predict the performance of, of uh, reservoir rocks. And finally went on to do work on, on showing how this heterogeneity is actually related to the degree of trapping. Uh, so that's an example of the evolution of ideas and contribution of GSEP in one area. So I now want to move on to transportation. Um, so, so again, let's put ourselves back in the time 2002. Uh, if you look at the automobile efficiency stand, uh, effic the, the typical efficiency of an uh, American car that was being driven, uh, that they hadn't actually changed in a long time, uh, and advances in transportation, especially light duty, were sort of taking very place incrementally. And, uh, and, uh, and Chris Edwards came along and said, well, now is the time for bold and radical transformation, and why can't we have an engine that's more than 60% efficient? And he, through a number of projects, really pushed this efficiency frontier and showed that it's possible to have a, a sootless, uh, very, very high efficiency engine, and there and, uh, and are startup companies now pursuing uh, these ideas. Um, but at the same time, really the potential, the dream of electric cars was, was uh, beginning to, to, come to come to life, and, and, but you needed much, much better batteries. And, and Yi Shui uh, developed this idea of a silicon nanowire battery that could be much more, much have, a, have a much higher energy density than uh, the traditional lithium ion batteries that were being used. And, uh, and again, this has moved on, and there's a company who's working on this. But then the, a grand challenge, you know, and, and we had a great discussion yesterday about what do you do about really long distance transport? You know, what happens when you want to be able to go, you know, 600 miles or, you know, more? Um, and so, so Shen Wei Fan got the idea, well, why not make roadbeds where you have embedded uh, uh, magnetic induction that, that actually allows you to charge your car while you drive? Uh, then you don't need such a big battery in your car. And, uh, and this is kind of a wild idea, but actually that technology is now developed uh, that you can, um, you can move over a series of chargers and your car will, will be charged. So we can imagine a superhighway between here in LA or here in New York that, um, that you get to drive along. And when you get to your destination, you've got just as full of battery as you had when you started. Um, but, but again, batteries have, have challenges, particularly some of these more advanced, uh, advanced chemistries, and the cycling of batteries uh, degrades them. And so, uh, so uh, Yi Shui and, and colleague Zhen and Bao developed a, a basically a self-healing polymer that, that could make the battery life extend much longer. And then finally, uh, we got into, into the business of lightweighting cars. You know, imagine a car where you have a, this, this plastic shell, beautiful concept car, but in order to make that happen, in order to make that work, you need coatings that, that make that plastic just as safe and, and durable uh, as, uh, as, the, as the glass and, and, uh, and the coatings we use today. And you'll hear about that. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to photovoltaics. We did a lot of work, you know, really, the holy grail here is to make uh, solar electricity cheap enough so it's available to everyone everywhere. Uh, at the time, uh, the panels were costing, uh, or modules were costing about $3 a, a watt, way, way too expensive. We need something more like 30 cents, uh, 30 cents a watt. And, uh, and silicon was the, the dominant technology that was being at the, used at the time, and, and, and the complexity of manufacturing that made it uh, seem difficult to, to really drive down that cost curve. So many uh, different ideas, thin film technologies, third generation ideas were being pursued to try to drive down these costs. And Mike McGeehy uh, here at Stanford uh, was working on organic solar cells and he got this idea that you could have basically an ordered bulk heterojunction injunction, uh, junction, uh, solar cell uh, that would optimize both light absorption as well as electron transport. 
And, uh, and moving on then, so if you think about uh, thin film solar cells, the, the thinner you can make them, the less materials you need. Also, uh, you have a higher chance of actually being extract the, 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 the electrical energy from that. And so Mark Grongersma and colleagues at Caltech uh, developed some very elegant and important theories about how you could trap light in very, very thin film so that you could, you could make these very uh, thin film solar cells that had very, very high performance. And, and other materials were important. So, and Jenna Bao developed the concept of, uh, of transparent conducting electrodes made out of carbon nanotubes with, with fullerene glue. Uh, to make stretchable and flexible transparent electrodes. And again, there's a company here that, uh, that is actually working on these ideas. And then she went a little farther and said, well, but let's make an all uh, carbon solar cell. Every single component, uh, every single active component would be uh, carbon based and, and was able to demonstrate uh, through uh, uh, building uh, one of these. And then finally, thinking now what's, what's happening is, you know, the perovskite revolution is, has uh, really turned uh, uh, the solar PV uh, world, you know, on its head. It used to take, uh, you know, decades to, to improve the efficiency. And this family of, of materials, perovskites, over a very, very short time went from low efficiencies to, to, to high efficiencies. And, and Mike McGee, again, working on this, developed the idea of a tandem cell made entirely of perovskite uh, and, and is the world record holder for efficiency uh, for those cells. Okay, so, uh, so another area, um, renewable fuel synthesis. Okay, so, so if you think back to, to that time period um, and you look at the, the energy contained in the sun or if you look at you know, abundant uh, wind energy, uh, the idea is you'd make electricity. But, uh, but even back then, we had faculty members who said, yeah, but, you know, can't we do something else? You know, heat's good, electricity is good, but what we really need is a fuel because we need to power our transportation. Uh, we also need to store massive quantities of energy uh, that it, we, it would be hard to store in a battery. So why not make renewable fuels? And, and at the time, there was a lot of work on biofuels, which is one form. Um, but, uh, but there were other ideas, and, and, uh, and we were able to engage uh, you know, leaders like uh, Nate Lewis, who was working on artificial photosynthesis, the idea that you'd essentially you know, make a leaf-like structure that would uh, capture solar energy and basically produce hydrogen, and worked on this very uh, uh, elegant and, and, and novel device architecture that would allow you to do that. This led to, to this early support to Nate Lewis, led actually to the development of JCAP, one of the, the Department of Energy's major uh, efforts into renewable fuels. Um, other challenges, so, so it turns out silicon is actually a pretty good material for uh, splitting, uh, splitting water. That's what you want to do, make hydrogen. Um, but, uh, but it's highly corroded. It can be highly corroded in that environment. So, so, uh, so um, Paul McIntyre and Chris Chidsey came up with the idea that you could actually put a coating with uh, ALD, uh, atomic layer deposition, and, and they sh were able to show that you could make these coatings and protect the silicon and get very high, uh, high performance from those devices. Uh, but, but what about uh, doing something more than that? Hydrogen is great, um, but, but fossil, you know, carbon-based fuels are better. In particular, you can make liquids out of uh, carbon-based uh, carbon materials. And Tom Harmio and, and his colleagues and students uh, started to work on this, and they did some very interesting experiments with a novel reactor. And they were able to show that, uh, that during CO2 reduction on copper surfaces, you were actually making a whole host of uh, organic molecules that had heretofore been not even um, uh, known. And, and again, there's, there's a startup uh, working on this idea that, that you're going to hear about. Uh, Matt Cannon uh, discovered a very interesting material, uh, a copper oxide derived uh, catalyst that had very, very high selectivity and performance for making ethanol. And, uh, and did some work to be able to show that it was actually the green boundaries in this unique uh, nanostructured catalyst that uh, led to these very high uh, 
um, performance with regard to ethanol production. And more recently, Tom, uh, Tom Jaramillo has been working on, on advanced materials for, um, for oxygen evolution. So again, moving from hydrogen uh, to, uh, to, to uh, carbon-based fuels based entirely on renewable energy. Okay, so I'll say a little bit about biomass. Um, I, I mentioned that at the time, corn-based ethanol was, was a well-established well uh, technology, though it was really quite controversial at the time. There was a big question, how much benefit is there? Because uh, when you're making uh, corn, uh, ethanol from corn, the energetic inputs from fertilizer and so forth are very high. And so we were looking for alternatives. Uh, but one of the big questions came is, well, what really is the, the global potential for biofuels? And some people said you can do the whole energy system based on that. Others said the potential is very, very little. And, and so Chris Field and his colleagues came up with a very authoritative uh, database, rigorous study, suggesting that the global potential for biofuels was on the, something on the order of 15% of the global energy demand, uh, assuming we didn't uh, use the same lands that are needed for food and that we would preserve wild lands. Um, but they also made the point that the climate change itself was going to change, uh, change the landscape and that, uh, and they were able to make some predictions about how quickly habitats would shift. Uh, with changing climates, uh, which is important, has an important implications for the availability of that 15%. Uh, they also went on to ask questions about, well, are biofuels good for the environment? And they, they came up with some very interesting work to show that the albedo uh, would actually change if you had large areas of, of, uh, of, of regions uh, producing biofuels. Uh, and you could actually have local cooling, uh, a benefit from, from doing that. Also very interested in, uh, in other approaches uh, for using biology to, to make fuels, and, and Jim Swartz has done some really excellent work uh, improving the ability of, uh, of uh, uh, enzymatic production of, of hydrogen. And we had a great team uh, from around the world really working on, on the lignin management problem. And they were able to, uh, in a collective activity, make some real breakthroughs on being able to engineer plants that could produce much more sugar than, than the traditional plants, and you'll hear more about that. Um, and then finally, what about the idea that you take an electrode, you, you provide electricity, you make that an energy source for a microbial community, and if you did that, would they synthesize fuels for you? Well, it was actually known that that, that worked, but the exact mechanism by which the electrons would go from the electrode to the, to the organism were not known. And if you, you know, given that that's such a critical aspect, you, know, you have to figure that out if you want to take this approach. And, and uh, Alfred Sporman, and together with his colleagues, actually have now identified the mechanism that the electrons are transferred. And, uh, and just briefly, I mentioned that we used systems analysis throughout this to help make good decisions for, for GSEP. And the first one that uh, today, there's this chart is uh, in many places, uh, it was an exergetic analysis of uh, the global energy resource. We wanted to ask the question, really how much energy is available from all of these different sources? And this was the first way that provided an apples to apples comparison. So we really knew how big these resources were. We then moved on to define concepts as energy stored on investment. Uh, so it turns out that batteries take a lot of energy to make them. Uh, and some types of batteries, actually, you only get a little bit more energy out than you put in over the lifetime of, of that battery that's operating. And, and what we learned, really, the key thing for research was here is we need to make batteries that last a lot longer if we want to use them for grid-scale storage. We also answered questions like, is the photovoltaic industry a net energy producer to society? And we were actually able to show that there was a period of about 10 years where we were putting so much energy into making new photovoltaic panels, and they were taking so much energy to make that, that it wasn't a net electricity producer. But, uh, but with improvements in technology, we were able to show that in around 2012 or so that the photovoltaic industry became a net uh, electricity producer. Um, 
We also showed, this, uh, uh, showed that, uh, that sometimes it makes more sense to curtail renewable energy than it does to store it because the energy it took to build that battery or, or fuel cell um, was so much that, um, that, that we should think about uh, that the best thing to do with renewable energy sometime may be to simply curtail. And then we said, well, what about fuel cells? Are fuel cells better or worse than batteries? Um, turns out that this sort of energy stored on investment for fuel cells is quite a bit better, about three times better than, uh, than for, for a battery. But because it's about three times less efficient, round trip efficiency, batteries and fuel cells are kind of a, a wash. Um, and finally did some really interesting work on, on looking at uh, electric transportation, battery electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, and found at least for two countries, Germany and, uh, and uh, the United States, that, uh, that battery electric vehicles are probably a more economical choice. And uh, just very quickly, a uh, couple of game changers. Some of the ideas we got were so radically new that we, uh, we just said we have to pursue them even though they seemed very high risk. And, uh, and, and one of them was something called PEAT, uh, Photon en Enhanced Thermionic Emission. Uh, Nick Milosh and, and Ziek Shen uh, pioneered this. There's now a large program in Europe pursuing this idea. Um, developed the idea of open framework batteries using really, really inexpensive materials uh, that, that could have essentially unlimited uh, cycle life. Uh, an aluminum, uh, aluminum uh, battery that could be charged in as little as a minute. And then finally, a technology you'll hear more about, radiative cooling, the idea that you could generate cool or coldness by capturing the energy that uh, uh, is associated with radiation from the Earth out into space. So uh, I just want to wrap up. Uh, we've got a great program for you. Uh, we have plenary presentations, and, and I'll introduce those as we come along. Uh, we have a fantastic panel. Many of the early sponsors of, our, of, of GSEP are back here, and we're going to look back 15 years. We're going to look at where we are now and look to the 15 years in the future. Of course, we have our technical sessions, which are really the heart of GSEP, and, and you're going to hear a lot of great talks from, from leaders in the field. Um, we also have a new special session called Innovators to Watch. Uh, these are people who really didn't participate in GSEP, but who have come to and joined our Stanford community. And, uh, and they're going to do great things, and you're going to get to hear a little bit from each of them. Uh, we have our technology showcase. Um, there are many uh, spin-offs that, that have, uh, have come from the, the GSEP activities, and, and you're going to hear about some of those. Also some from other parts of Stanford. Um, our students. Um, they're my favorite part. Uh, we have our distinguished student lectures. They put all of the faculty, all of us, to shame because they do such a great job talking about their work. Uh, we have our great poster session uh, from uh, GSEP, uh, as well as uh, we've got something new. We've got posters from another program called our Energy Transformation Collaborative to showcase that and our student social. And this is the last GSEP symposium. I want to let everybody know GSEP has you know, made uh, tremendous contributions to our community and really laid the foundation for transformational energy research here. Um, we continue to work with all of our partners. We have lots of exciting uh, plans and development uh, and with, with our existing sponsors and, and even a broader group. Um, and, and the bottom line is that there's a lot of work to be done. This is a, the 36 billion tons worth of CO2 per year's worth of work to be done between now and when our job is finished. So for the students uh, out in the audience here, um, this is a really good problem to work on because I think you'll have a lot of job security to work on decarbonizing the global energy system. And I just want to say one more thing, really a thank you to somebody. Where is he? There's Richard Sassoon. Can you stand up, Richard? I personally have to thank you. I, we have room for lots of time for lots of thanks at the end of this, but I, if anyone was going to leave, I just wanted uh, them to realize the incredibly important role you played. So thank you, Richard. So.
Okay, we're now going to move on. And, uh, and I'm really delighted to introduce our next speaker. Um, it's someone I came to know, she is someone I came to know when, uh, when I started to serve on the Science Policy Board at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, she had been at Cornell University in, in 2014. Um, uh, no, actually, I've got this wrong. She came back to Stanford in 2002. Uh, she went on to be the director of, uh, of the, the National Laboratory here on the Stanford campus. She did an amazing job. Um, and, uh, and, and after that, she became the dean of the School of Engineering, and she is now our new provost, which we are absolutely delighted about that. So uh, please join me in welcoming Provost Persis Strahl. <laughs> 